One of the worst things you can do to a snail, besides straight up crushing them, is to give him the old salt shower. It's a painful, agonizing death, as the salt pulls all of the water out of the snail's body in a matter of minutes. Don't do this, it's unethical, and makes you look like a psychopath, which you might be if you specifically want to do this to snails now that I brought it up. Despite this most awful act humans can inflict, nature provides a parasitic relationship involving snails, which, though less gruesome in practice, will very likely make you more squeamish in concept. Imagine you're a snail. Imagine the everyday life you now endure as such a simple garden snail. You're prone to drying out, so you must stick to the moistest areas in your environment. Shade protects you from the sun's desiccating rays, and coming out mostly at night helps to stave off desiccation even more. You slither in the shadows among dense vegetation, eating as much of it as your toothless mouth hole can stand. One day, as you're minding your own snaily business, you receive a smell riding on the winds. Do you smell it? That smell. A kind of smelly smell. A smelly smell that smells. Smelly. Particularly of bird droppings. Yum. As a snail, the smell of a steaming bird turd rouses your stomach to act. As a delicious, nutritious treat to a snail, you slurp the ooey-gooey treat down your slime-coated jawless throat. You've successfully defeated hunger. Good on you, snail. Many days pass since you first guzzled warm hot bird shit, and you begin to feel weird. Weirder than someone would normally feel after guzzling warm hot bird shit. Against every instinct instilled in your genes over the hundreds of millions of years of your kind's existence, you come out of the shadows and into direct sunlight. You feel like it's normal, just going about your business, but this time in the open and in the light of day. This makes you open to attack from predators, but it's no biggie. Your foul-tasting slime has taught most birds that snails like you are absolutely disgusting creatures unfit for avian consumption. You also have a hard shell to retreat to if some big nasty comes over for a quick bite. I hate to break it to you, but all of those changes you were feeling, and the change to your day-to-day -day routine, has changed you. Part of you no longer looks like a snail. Your eyes are now engorged and vibrating in bedazzling bands of colors, which look suspiciously like the worms eaten by birds. You made sure to stay away from predators, but it wasn't your predators which are now messing with you. It's a parasite. Those lip-smackingly delicious avian excreta you consumed days ago were spiked with the eggs of a parasite which belongs to the genus Leucochloridium. Leucochloridium is a parasitic worm which invades the bodies of a few species of snails. The end of its life cycle within the snail host includes living in the eye stalks of the host snail, where it fills the eye stalks with fluid. Then it begins to pulsate to imitate the movements of a caterpillar. The genus Leucochloridium has about eight species within it. All of them look similar to one another and parasitize snails in the same way. The major characteristic we can use to distinguish between the species are the colors they take when they move into the snail's eye stalks. The two most well-known species are Leucochloridium paradoxum and Variae. Paradoxum is also called the green banded brood sac, since its bands are usually of a greenish color. Variae is called the brown banded brood sac, for the same reason except its bands are a brownish color. Traditionally, the colors and shapes of the different brood sac flatworms were used to differentiate between species. This used to be the common way to tell different species apart before the advent of genetic analyses. It was a common practice, even with large, complex animals we are extremely familiar with. This also bled into the field of paleontology during its early days, resulting in a load of unnecessary species. Recently, genetic analysis has proven the color and shape differences between brood sacs actually correlate to a genetic difference in species as well. Leucochloridium species belong to the Platyhelminthes phylum, which means they're flatworms. Platyhelminthes are relatively simple, bilaterally symmetric animals found throughout the world. As a group, they're defined more by what they lack than what they have. They're missing all the things we enjoy, 
like internal body cavities, a specialized circulatory system, respiratory organs, or segmentation. This forces them into a flat, worm-like shape in order to take in oxygen through their skin and allows a certain level of flexibility when it comes to a lifestyle. Though the name of the group is dangerously complex Latin, the members of this extremely speciose group may be familiar. Tapeworms, terrestrial hammer-headed flatworms, marine sea slug-like flatworms, and many intestinal parasites make up the group. Leucochloridium species start out as eggs laid by their parent in the intestines of a bird. The sexually mature adult worm lays its eggs in the intestine, so the eggs make their way into the bird's droppings by being pulled along for the ride to the exit. Upon exiting the cloaca, they now stick wherever they were dropped. The cycle kicks into high gear when any one of many species of snails consumes the bird droppings, unintentionally ingesting the eggs. The eggs hatch into larvae called myricidium. They usually hatch once ingested, but can sometimes hatch in the environment, in which case they need to find a host, and fast. These free-swimming, ciliated, little babies act almost like a single-celled organism, as they have no mouths and cannot digest food. That's because this form is used by the organism to get from point A to point B. In this case, point B is the digestive tract of the unlucky snail. The next stage for the brood sac flatworm is called the sporocyst. The sporocyst is an elongated sac which looks like a bunch of whitish tissue, usually planted firmly near the snail's liver. It grows, tumor-like, to penetrate and entangle the internal organs of the snail. Feeling squeamish yet? This sporocyst is still somewhat part of the larval stage of the worm's life, and morphs into a brood sac once it has asexually reproduced enough. If I boil this down even more, you could look at it as an egg which hatches into a spore creature that infects its host and becomes a breeding factory to produce a different kind of spore. This new spore is called the Cercaria. The Cercaria form is when the worm begins to look more like a worm again. This is also considered the larval form. The Cercariae of the brood sac flatworm look, as you can see, like a tube with two tails on one end and a swollen peanut on the other end. Once the cercaria stage has formed, they become a cyst within the brood sac. None of these forms ever have mouths, so, like many parasitic worms, such as the horsehair worm that infects and mind controls crickets, it simply sits around soaking up the snail's hard-earned nutrients through its skin. At this point, the parasite has already castrated the snail. A parasite doesn't want the host to waste energy on itself that could be going directly to the parasite. The parasite castrates the snail to force it to stop using its energy to produce eggs and sperm, so it can take all of the energy it needs from the snail. Like a clubgoer downing vodka Red Bulls, it's gonna need energy if it's gonna dance. This organic breeding facility then migrates forward in the snail until it has pushed itself inside the eye stalks of the hapless land mollusk. Now begins the zombie part of the zombie snail phenomena. The brood sac runs into a problem. It needs to be eaten by another host to complete its life cycle. It just so happens that birds make a great host for these worms. How is the parasite going to get from the snail to the bird? You see, snails are generally nocturnal and come out at night to take advantage of the cooler temperatures and higher humidity. Coming out for longer periods of time during the day is extremely dangerous for the snail, and not just because of predators, but because of the sun's desiccating rays. The birds which mostly eat insects are usually diurnal animals which hunt by sight. Once the leucochloridium has bloated the hell out of the snail's eye stalks, it manipulates the snail's behavior. Somehow, the parasite forces the snail's brain to move it from under the foliage and out of the underbrush so it's in the open for all to see. The parasite also makes sure to mess with the snail's perception of light. Leucochloridium probably manipulates its host's brain with chemicals it secretes, but exactly what those chemicals are and exactly how it does it remains a mystery. Once the wormy cercariae and the brood sac itself bloat the snail's eye stalks, they begin to pulsate forward and back. Though the brood sac flatworm doesn't really have much in the way of light-sensing organs, it must be able to sense the difference between light and dark, 
the Polish researchers, who confirmed the relationship between parasite and host, found the parasite only pulsates in daylight. Somehow, without a nervous system or any sense organs, they recognize when it's worth the energy to pulsate in the host eye stalks and when it's not worth it. This remains even more of a mystery. Snails with this infection are reported to be up to thrice as active as a non-zombified snail. One was noted as moving a whole 3 feet, 0.91 meters, in 15 minutes. For a snail, that's no half-assed waddle to the fridge for munchies. That's a mad dash to close your browser before your parents barge into your room. The sack has developed bands of color near the front end, which just so happen to be visible through the snail's transparent skin. See this snail? It has one green and one brown eye stalk. That's because it's infected with two species of the brood sack flatworm. As crazy as it sounds, a single snail host can be infected by multiple species of brood sacs. One study found a host with three species inside it, Leucochloridium paradoxum, perturbatum, and Voctianum. In other species of trematodes, the more specific family to which these worms belong, competition between the asexual stages of multiple species in the same host usually end up with one supreme parasite. It's entirely possible Many snail hosts are infected by multiple brood sacs, but people only ever observe a host snail after one of the brood sacs has outcompeted the others, resulting in a host with only one visible parasite. Forcing the snail to be in the open, making them rockstar energy drink addicted hyperactive maniacs, using bizarre color choices, and ballooning their eye stalks were all in service of making the parasite and in turn, the host's eye stalks look finger-licking good to an over-observant, insectivorous passerine bird. The pulsating, multi-banded eye stalks look like something the bird would definitely get there early for. Maggots, worms, and caterpillars. This is exactly the intention of the brood sack flatworm. This is what it wants. This is why it messes up a this snail so much. Like. This is what we act like. This is what everybody was like before us. This is what I am! I'm a throwback! I'm here! The worm-snail relationship has been known since the early 1800s from much of Europe and parts of North America. But it was only in 2013 that Polish researchers confirmed the parasite actually controls its snail host. It was found the Paradoxum species is host species specific, meaning it can only manipulate one species of snail, namely the amber snails of the Sukinia genus. Snail peepers are weird. At the tips of snail eye stalks sit a rudimentary eye spot. This kind of eye is only good at telling the difference between light and dark. They do not see color, and they do not focus. Though snails don't have the muscles for focusing on objects, they do have muscles which help to retract the eye stalks into the head. This is easy to do because the eye stalks are relatively hollow tubes filled with fluid. To bring the eye stalks into the head, the snail releases tension and they invert. To say hello to the world, it tenses its muscles and fills the inverted eye stalks back up with fluid. When the snail is afflicted with leucochloridium, this is difficult to impossible to do. The parasite bloats the eye stalks up so badly, the snail can no longer retract them. Imagine being left with one or both of your eyes massively distended and strobing non-stop. If our slimy cinnamon roll friends had emotions, this would have to be maddening. This disgustingly amazing process, which makes one's palms sweaty, ends in the snail's eyes plucked out by a bastard bird. To be honest, I'm still unconvinced birds aren't just robots planted by the government. I'm watching you, pigeon. Passerine birds are the group which songbirds belong to. These birds don't usually target snails, mostly due to the nasty slime they make. Since these birds don't eat snails, they rip out the snail's eye stalks and leave the rest behind. During the off chance, one or both swollen eye stalks burst before being eaten by a bird. The caterpillar doppelganger pulsates out onto a leaf and continues its party show until the whole organism dries up and dies, because it really, really just needs to be eaten. I think we found an animal with a vor fetish besides some humans. Ha! You thought it was all over for the snail once the bird bot plucked out its eyes, but you'd be wrong. Though the snail dies, it actually lives. 
yeah, so since the eyes of a snail are so bad and not super well connected to everything internally, and because mollusks are just super weird, the eyes can grow back good as new. On top of new eyes, the snail can also regenerate its genitals, so it can get funky with other snails once again. What's good for the goose is good for the gander, as the surviving, regenerative ability of the snail is perfect for the parasite as well. The wounded snail can now become a host for the parasite again. Each snail is a perpetual parasite pumping machine. Now eaten by a bird, Leucochloridium reaches its final, sexually mature adult stage. The worms grow and reproduce in the bird's gut. Leucochloridium worms are weird compared to their broader relatives. Many of the trematode worms, part of the flatworm phylum, go through three hosts, two intermediate hosts, and one primary host. The primary host is usually the parasite's maturing and breeding ground before death and spreading of the eggs. Our diabolical friend here only needs two hosts. More than half of all critters skittering across this godforsaken rock we live on are parasitic. Don't believe me? Look it up. Us non-parasitic animals are in the minority. I think the vast differences in lifestyles between even closely related parasites shows just how creepy and diverse the animal kingdom can be. What other parasites might we find to get under our skin next? Let's check out the fossil record to see how our modern rogues gallery of parasites came to be. Stay tuned. Make sure you like this video and share it around. Leave a comment if you like and subscribe. Hit the bell icon too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Pledge to my Patreon at any tier you like for a slew of many delicious offerings. Special thanks to patrons Dinosaur, Natty Cat, Ed Peretz, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, Dana Manchester, Aphid Kirby, and Antron.